we are going to be talking about linearity and superposition today. Um, and we are going to take possibly an odd approach um, because I'm an odd guy. So I'm going to, let me think how to put this. Let me write this down first before I even forget that. So linearity and superposition. Okay, so generally speaking, if you were to look at a textbook written on circuit analysis techniques, um, it will definitely have some mention of the superposition theorem in there somewhere. And we're definitely going to talk about that. Uh, but the superposition theorem is really part of a larger concept called linearity. Um, so for those of you who are in electrical engineering, biomedical engineering, and I believe mechanical engineering, you will literally take classes just on how to analyze linear systems. Um, so for electrical engineers, we have one course called Linear Signals and Systems, uh, which is where we're looking at linear systems in the time domain. Then we have a class called Digital Signal Processing, where we look at them in the uh, discrete time domain. Uh, biomedical engineers have uh, those two classes kind of balled together as one class. Mechanical engineers will have a course on dynamic systems and all of that kind of stuff. This is just one of those fundamental building blocks of those type of things. So depending on your major, you might see some of this um, later on. But it is a pretty interesting concept, at least to me, and its applications towards the field of circuit analysis um, can be uh, can can provide interesting results. Okay, so up to this point, we've looked at everything in terms of a circuit, and we're going to abruptly shift gears here and talk about things from a systems context, and then learn how to apply that towards a circuit. Okay, so let's say that I have. some system whose transfer function is given by h of x. Now I understand wholeheartedly that a lot of you guys don't know what a transfer function or anything like that is at all just yet, and that's perfectly okay, all right? So on the left-hand side of this system is where I'm going to apply my inputs. So, this signal, x1 as a function of time, just represents some input or stimulus. So in the context of electrical engineering, this could be a voltage or a current, okay? And x2 is just some different stimulus or some different way to excite the system. So it could be just a different voltage or current. On the output side of this system, we are going to have our responses. So we'll call those just Y1 as a function of time, where Y1 could once again be a voltage or current, and Y2 as a function of time, which is just the output corresponding to input X2, could be a voltage or current. So if our system were linear, then what we would see is that for an input x1 of t plus an input of x2 of t, our total output response, y of t, would be equal to h acting on some total input x of t. And so I'm gonna generalize this a little bit more, okay? So we could say that our output y1 of t plus our output y2 of t would be because our system acts on the combination of our inputs x1 of t 
and x2 of t. Now, if our system is linear, there are a couple of other conditions that we can add to this. So in a linear system, if I scale my input by an arbitrary factor, so let's just call this some constant C1, then my output associated with that input scales by the same factor. And if I scale a different input by a different arbitrary constant, which I'm gonna call C2, then the output associated with X2 scales by that same factor. So I have in front of you a bunch of mathematical gobbledygook that may or may not make a lick of sense to you guys right now, and that's okay. We're gonna contextualize things here. So this mathematical proof-ish thing here, or result, um, is really a combination of two distinct properties of linearity. We have an additive property of linearity, and then we also have a homogeneity or scaling property of linearity. So let's talk through both of those things really quick, okay? So the additive property of linearity. So looking at just that portion of things, if I have my system and I apply some individual input, x1 of t, and I measure some individual output, y1 of t, and I take that same system and I apply an input of x2 of t and measure an output of y2 of t, if my system is linear, then if I apply both of those inputs, x1 of t and x2 of t, then my output will simply be a combination of y1 of t and y2 of t. So let's apply this to a circuit. So let's say that I have the following circuit where I have just a 10 volt source. Let's put this as a six ohm resistor. Let's put an eight ohm resistor here. Um, a four ohm resistor here. and then a two amp source over here. And my ultimate goal in this particular circuit is to figure out what the voltage drop across my eight ohm resistor is, okay? So ultimately, we're trying to figure out what V8 is. So based on our current level of knowledge of circuit theory, we could, if we were so inclined, throw some combination of Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and Ohm's law at this to determine that voltage V8. So let's talk about what that approach might entail, which I'm going to call a kind of kitchen sink approach, where we're just throwing everything at it and seeing what sticks, right? So I'm going to define some voltages. So let's say that the voltage drop across the 6 ohm resistor is some voltage V6, and the voltage drop across 
The four ohm resistor is some voltage V4. For what it's worth, I chose to put the positive polarity terminal on the right because I know that that two amp current is gonna flow in that. So that's just gonna give me a positive voltage there. So I'm just trying to force things to happen kind of the way I want them to. Um, I'm gonna make an assumption here that the voltage drop across the current source will have the positive polarity on top um, so that the current source is supplying power. I don't really have any reason to assume that. I'm just gonna assume that since it's a source, it's probably supplied. Okay. I could also go through and define some currents, right? So I could say that the current that's leaving my voltage source um, and flowing through the six ohm resistor could be represented as a variable I6. Um, the current that's flowing down through my eight ohm resistor, I could call that I8. And this current that's flowing through my four ohm resistor, I could call I4, but I can see very easily by inspection that that's gonna be just two amps. So I probably won't ever actually use the variable I4. So, I believe at this moment, every single voltage and every single current in my system has some sort of label. So now I'm in a good position to just throw things at it and see what shakes out, okay? So if I were to apply Kirchhoff's current law at that top middle node, I have a current of I6 flowing in. So I6 is flowing in. I have a current of two amps flowing in. And this will be equal to the current that's flowing out, which is I8. And for simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna rearrange this very slightly and say, that I8 minus I6 is equal to two amps. Are we okay with that <laughs> level of algebra? Now, just because I've done this so many times, I'm gonna just apply Kirchhoff's voltage law around that left-hand loop. So if we apply KVL around the left-hand loop, what we're gonna wind up getting is negative 10 volts plus V6 plus V8 is equal to zero, which we could rearrange as V8 plus V6 is equal to 10 volts. And because I know Ohm's law, I could say that I8 is just V8 over eight ohms. And I could say that I6 is just V6 over six ohms. And then I could substitute these relationships into here, giving me V8 over eight ohms plus V6 over six ohms is equal to two amps. And I now have a two equation, that cut off what I wanted to, two unknown system that I could use to solve for the quantities V8 and V6. And since I was looking for V8, effectively, I'm done. So let's use our calculators and solve this simple system of equations. If I am not mistaken, I believe that you guys learned how to solve a system of equations 
using your calculators back in probably engineering 122 or so. Yes. Oh, you're absolutely right. Thank you for that. Yes. So when I substituted it in here, that should definitely be a minus. Thank you for that. That will give us erroneous results. So that is important. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's see. So this will be a bit easier for you guys to see. Um, I'm going to do this using my digital copy, if I still have a license for it, of my TI calculator, because that's the one that I prefer. Continue with the trial. Okay. So let me clear all this jibber jabber out. So to use a TI, it says 30X Pro, but that calculator doesn't exist. It's a 36. Um, so to solve a system of equations using a TI-36, I would press uh, second and then the tangent button to bring up my system solver menu. My equation is a two, uh, it's a two equation, two unknown systems. So I'm gonna choose option one. Uh, the coefficient for my first variable, which is V8 was one eighth in my first equation. So I'm just gonna do one over eight. Enter, um, move this guy over. The coefficient for V6 in my first equation was negative one sixth. Press enter. Uh, my constant term was two amps. So I'm just gonna put equals to two, enter. Uh, and then my coefficient for my second equation, if I'm remembering correctly, is uh, one V8. So just one goes here plus one V six, so one goes here, is equal to 10 volts. So are those coefficients correct based on the system that I had a moment ago? Everything seem okay? So if I solve this system, I get X or V eight is equal to 88 over seven, and y or v6 is equal to negative 18 over seven. And so I'm going to just write down those results here really quickly. So solving things, I found that v8 was 88 over seven volts and v6 was, sorry, I have goldfish memory, uh, negative 18 over seven volts. So that wasn't too particularly bad for me, a jackass with a PhD who has done this a number of times. Uh, honest assessment, how long do you guys think it would have taken you to be able to figure out how to solve for that quantity Vx or V8, excuse me? I hear six hours. I heard, I think somebody said all damn day. Um, so might take you guys a while, right? So we can use the additivity property of linearity to make this a lot easier, okay? So what the additivity property of linearity tells us is that if I analyze my circuit with only one source on, so if my voltage source is the input X1, I will get some response. If my current source is the input X2, I will get some response. And if I add those two responses together, it will be the exact same result as if I had analyzed the circuit with both sources on at the same time, okay? That's really what the superposition principle is, okay? So if we want to apply superposition to this, we are going to analyze the circuit twice, but the circuit will be easier in both cases to analyze than the original circuit, okay? So we're gonna look at our first case where the voltage source is on and the current source is off. And this 
makes us have to think about how we turn a particular device off, okay? So I'm gonna redraw my original circuit just completely normal, okay? So I believe I had a 10 volt source over here. And then I think this was a six ohm resistor. This was an eight ohm resistor. This was a four ohm resistor. This was a two amp source direction up. And I was looking for the voltage drop across the eight ohm resistor. So did I draw my original circuit correctly? <laughs> Make sure my memory isn't that garbage. Okay. So right now my voltage source is on and my current source is also on. So I need to figure out how to turn the current source off. So how much current do you think a current source that is off supplies? Zero amps. So we need to replace that two amp current source with something that guarantees that no current can flow through that branch. So what do we know of that guarantees no current can flow? An open circuit. So if we want to turn off a current source, we just replace it with an open circuit. So I'm gonna make a note of that over here on the right. To turn off a current source, replace it with an open circuit. So, because we've made a modification to our circuit, I'm no longer gonna call this voltage V8. I'm just gonna call it V8 prime. So that's just letting me know I'm doing something different. This isn't the total solution. This is just going to be a part of it. So looking at this circuit right here, how could we find that voltage V8 prime? I think we learned a really easy way to do it in our last class meeting called voltage division, right? So if we apply voltage division to this circuit, um, we should be able to find V8. So I want you guys to tell me how we would make voltage division work for this thing. So we have our voltage source of 10 volts. What's gonna go in the numerator of our ratio of resistances? the eight ohm resistor, because that's the one we're finding the voltage drop over. What's gonna go in the denominator? So what's the equivalent resistance seen by the 10 volt source? What was that? 14. So 14, which is just eight plus six. Why is the four ohm resistor not contributing anything? It's not part of a closed current carrying loop, so it's just kind of dangling over there and it won't influence our equivalent resistance. So 8 14 times 7, I'm going to be lazy, so that's 80 over 14, uh, or 40 over 7 volts. Any questions about the analysis that we did there or how to turn off the current source or anything like that? Fairly straightforward, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you can do that. Or you could leave three on and turn two off and then do the opposite of that. Just whatever makes the most sense to make the analysis easier. As long as each source is on exactly once, you're okay. So let's look at our second case. So current source, excuse me, voltage source off. And current source on. So once again, I'm just gonna redraw my entire original circuit.
here is the voltage V8 I'm interested in. And now I'm gonna analyze the circuit with just the current source on. So hopefully this is an obvious answer or, or, or this question has an obvious answer, but how much voltage should be supplied by a voltage source that's off? Zero volts. What do we know of that forces the voltage drop across something to be zero? A wire, a short circuit. The voltage drop across the short circuit is always zero, so we will just replace our voltage source with a wire. So I'll make a note of that over here. To turn off a voltage source, replace it with a short circuit. So since we've made a modification, I'm gonna just call this V8 double prime. So this is my second iteration, so that's why it's getting a double prime designation. So how could we solve for that voltage V8 double prime? Ashton, you're whispering to Caroline. Would you care to whisper to me what you want to do? That's okay. I also believe that we could use Ohm's law and that that would be the most efficient way to do it. Now, could you describe how you might use Ohm's law to do this? Indeed. So how did, uh, where did you, I thought I heard you say 12 and I'm not sure where that came from. Okay, so you've made a, a small mistake there. So I 100% agree. If we combine the six ohm resistor and the eight ohm resistor, we have some equivalent resistance and we're just trying to find the voltage drop across that. We don't need to bother with including the four ohm resistor though because that one is in series with the other ones, right? So all two amps of current, let me make a note here. So all two amps of current has to flow through the four ohm resistor before it hits that parallel network. So to me, V8 double prime would just be two amps times eight in parallel with six. So that would be six ohms, times eight ohms over six ohms plus eight ohms. Another thing that you could do if you were so inclined would be to apply current division to find the current that's flowing down through the eight ohm resistor and then multiply that by eight ohms. But as it turns out, it will give you literally that exact same expression if you do it all in one step. Yeah. <laughs> so, if I throw this into my calculator, I have, um, so let's see. So I have a two in the numerator and a 14 in the denominator. So that's just gonna look like one seventh. So then I would have six times eight, which is 48 if my terrible ability to do simple math is correct. So 48 sevenths of a volt. So using these two results, I could say that V8 is just V8 prime plus V8 double prime would give me 40 plus 48 is 88 sevenths of a volt. How does that compare to our analysis when both sources were on? It's the same thing. So for this particular circuit, applying superposition actually makes the analysis much easier than just going at it um, and trying to just fit any and everything into the circuit analysis just to get a result out, okay? It won't always be true. So uh, me, superposition isn't just some um, Swiss Army knife that you can use in all situations, unfortunately. 
um, but it can be used to simplify circuit analysis where things work out nicely and neatly like this, which is why I made a circuit specifically where it would work out nicely and neatly, okay? So just to recap here, the additivity property of linearity which is more commonly known as the superposition principle, allows us to analyze a circuit with each independent source on by itself and then add those results together and it gives us the exact same overall result as if we had analyzed the circuit with all of the independent sources on. If we have dependent sources, we can never turn those off, okay? So dependent sources are always left on. Okay, can't do anything about that. Yes, sir. So if we wanted to, we could like any circuit, we could just break it down and like turn off the number of sources and all the samples. Sure. And so if any circuit that has more than one source, you can apply this method to. Will it make it easier? It depends on the circuit. But you can apply it to any circuit that has multiple independent sources. All right, so how do you guys feel about superposition or the additivity property? And if you had three sources, can you analyze it as both like both of one twice as long, or would you do one source and then one source? It depends entirely what you feel will uh, give you the easiest analysis path. So as long as when you're applying superposition, by definition, you are going to be analyzing the circuit more than once, right? Because you're looking at some sources on and some sources off. As long as each independent source is on only once, it doesn't matter. So you can do it, if it had three sources, you could do two on and one off, and then um, two off and one on, or you could do just one on and two off, one on and two off, one on and two off, and add them all together. It's the same result. Does not matter. So whatever makes it easier for you to analyze, do that. Yes. Fantastic question. So Connor here just asked, are we only working with linear systems in this class? The short answer is yes, okay? So let me explain why we're only working with linear systems and where we might work with a nonlinear system. So, or actually where you guys have worked with nonlinear systems, okay? So in a linear system, uh, one of the things that characterizes a, a linear system is that the output is proportional to the input. So anytime that we have a resistor, that is a linear circuit element because we know that the output voltage is proportional to the input current or the uh, output current is proportional to the input voltage because resistance is literally just the constant of proportionality between voltage and current in a particular element. As it turns out, there is a linear relationship between current and voltage for capacitors and inductors as well. So for any circuit containing resistors, capacitors, and inductors, it will always 100% of the time be a linear circuit. Where we might see a non-linear circuit would be a circuit that had something like a um, piezo resistor or something like that. Um, so that might be like a or a um, thermistor or something like that. Something whose resistance is allowed to change, not in relation to voltage or current, right? So because the temperature causes the resistance to change, it's a nonlinear circuit element. So at an individual point in time, it may behave linearly, linearly but overall it would be a nonlinear circuit element. And there are techniques to deal with that, which are covered in later circuits classes. But for you guys, everything is on easy street um, in as much as you don't have to worry about things like that. All of our resistors, capacitors, and inductors will never change value due to anything. So because the resistance, capacitances, and inductances are constant, we have linear systems, and so this will always work for this class. All right, so let's look at the homogeneity or scaling property.
So if we have a system and we apply some input x1 of t, we should be able to observe some output y1 of t. Okay. Well, if we take that same system and we scale that input x1 of t by some arbitrary amount, which I'll just call some constant c1, if the system is linear, the output will scale by that exact same amount. So we can think about this very intuitively. If I have a five volt source connected to a five ohm resistor, what's the current flowing through the resistor? One amp, right? Five volts over five ohms is one amp because Ohm's law is great. If I double the voltage, what happens to the current? It doubles. That is the scaling property of linearity. Okay. So let's prove it. Okay. So let's say that I take my original circuit, but I scale my voltage source by a factor of two so that I get 20 volts here. I scale my current source by a factor of two so that I get four amps here. Um, so let's see, so this was six, this is four, this is eight, and here is V8. So my prediction based on the homogeneity or scaling property is that my voltage V8 should be um, whatever 88 over seven is times two. So that would be 176 over seven. Did I do 88 times two correctly? So how do you want to analyze this circuit to prove that? We could, if we were so inclined, use the kitchen sink approach, or we can apply superposition to this again and come out that way, right? So using the superposition method, we would have this circuit where we have 20, here's a six ohm resistor, here's an eight ohm resistor, Here's the voltage V8. Here's our four ohm resistor. So what would V8 prime be? We could solve it the exact same way we did earlier. So our known voltage is now 20 volts, eight ohms over 14 ohms. So that's gonna look like 160 over 14, which is 80 over seven. And it's exactly twice as large as what we got the last time we did this because the voltage is twice as large, okay? For um, the other bit with our voltage source turned off, here's our six ohm resistor. Here's our eight ohm resistor. This is gonna be V8 double prime. Here's our four ohm resistor. And our two amp, excuse me, this should be a four amp current source. I forgot to double it. And V8 double prime would be four amps times eight ohms times six ohms over eight ohms plus six ohms. Um, so just four times 48 over 14 comes out to be 96 over seven. Add those up and V8 is equal to V8 single prime plus V8 double prime gives us, let's see, so 80 plus 96 is 176 over seven volts. So 
we got the same result. Now this particular example really only showed us the scaling property independently, but we just happened to use the additivity property to get the result. So I wanna see what happens if we use both of them at the same time, okay? So what if I were to scale my voltage source by some factor and scale my current source by a different factor? Could I predict before doing any circuit analysis whatsoever what my end result should be, okay? So to sort this out, I'm gonna make a table. So what we found, so I'm going to put um, inputs on the left-hand side and outputs on the right-hand side, okay? So the first time that we analyzed this circuit, we had both a 10-volt source as an input and a 2-amp source as an input. And we got our output to be 88 sevenths of a volt. The next time we looked at this circuit, we did it with only the 10 volt source on. And we found that our output was 40 sevenths of a volt. We analyzed our circuit with only the two amp source on and we found our output was 48 sevenths of a volt. And then we scaled things. So we did twice the 10 volt input and twice the two amp input. And we got 176 over seven volts. So what I wanna see is what we think would happen if I scaled my voltage source by a factor of negative three, and I scaled my current source by a factor of positive three halves. Can we predict what will happen, okay? So, if I scale my voltage source by a factor of negative three, what do I think the output just due to that would be? Negative three times 40 over seven. So negative 120 over seven. If I scaled my current by a factor of positive three halves, what do you think my output would be just due to that? So 48 over seven times three halves. Seventy two over seven. When I add those results together, so negative one hundred and twenty plus seventy two, I get negative forty eight sevenths of a volt. So I have made a prediction about the behavior of a circuit that I haven't even drawn yet, okay? So let's see if it works. And we're gonna use the kitchen sink approach so that we can't have influenced anything, okay? So if I want my voltage source scaled by a factor of negative three, then I'm gonna have a 30 volt source, but I'm gonna put the positive polarity on bottom, negative polarity on top because Scaling by a factor of negative one is the same as just reversing the polarity, okay? So are we okay with why I have a 30 volt source there, positive polarity on bottom? My resistors remain unchanged. So here's my six ohm resistor. Here's my eight ohm resistor. Here's my four ohm resistor. My current source is scaled by a positive factor, so I'm not changing its direction. So what's two times three halves? Well, that's just three amps, right? And I'm looking for this voltage V8. So just very quickly adding the information back that I need to kind of replicate my approach from a little while ago. This is gonna be V6. Here's I6. 
here's I8. So if I apply Kirchhoff's current law at that top middle node, I'm going to have I8 minus I6 is equal to three amps. Are we okay with that? When I apply Kirchhoff's voltage law around my loop, I'm going to have V8 plus V6 is equal to negative 30 volts. And when I use my Ohm's law relationships, I8 is just V8 over 8. So that's going to be V8 over 8 ohms. V6 is just, excuse me, uh, I6 is just V6 over 6 ohms. So that'll be V6 over 6 ohms. And this will be equal to 3 amps. So once I had, again, I have two equations, two unknowns. So I can use the system that I had up here and just really change. So this should be three. That should be negative 30. All of the other parameters of my system haven't changed, right? The coefficients haven't changed because those resistor values didn't change. When I solve this, I get V8 is negative 48 over seven, which exactly matches what I predicted before I did any analysis whatsoever. Okay, so um, you've got an in-class assignment that will help you kind of work through some of these things. Um, before I let you guys work on that, I want to look at homework set number five on web work really quickly uh, to, to make some comments on things. Because this particular web work assignment annoys the bejesus out of me. And so I'm just going to give you guys some subtle guidance. Let's call it that. Okay. So if I pull up this web work assignment, when we look at homework set number five, let's look at problem one really quick. This circuit, and I don't know that you guys can see this title, but as the instructor, I can see that it's something having to do with source combination. So even though we talked about linearity and superposition today, do not use superposition on this circuit. It's pointless, effectively. Um, it, it's just not particularly good practice on this particular problem, okay? So problem number one, do not use superposition or anything like that. For this problem, so let's talk our way through this really quickly, okay? So we are told in this particular problem that if Ix, our response, is equal to 260 milliamps, then we need to find our input. And then in part B, we are told that if our input is 124 volts, find our response. So effectively, one way that you could approach this problem is you could work part A or part B and then use the results to automatically know what's going on in the other one because of the scaling property of linearity. So there's no reason whatsoever to analyze this circuit twice because if you know that an input of 124 volts gives you an output of two amps, then you can scale that two amps down to 260 milliamps to find the voltage source that caused that or vice versa, okay? so just work part A or part B and then use those results to do the other part. And then for part C, it is literally just find the ratio of whatever the VS was in part A to the IX is in part A or vice versa, the VS in part B to the IX in part B. I don't know what that's supposed to tell you, but 
you're asked to do it. So I'm just telling you very explicitly, it's literally just take your results from the same portion and then divide them for some asinine reason. Then we get to problem three. Okay, so first, I personally think it's unfair that you have three distinctly different circuits and they just call it one single problem because that's a lot of work to be done. Um, this circuit in part A is actually good practice for applying the superposition theorem. The circuit for parts B and C is very much not. You are effectively going to have to wind up setting up a system of equations to solve what output you get for this current source I1 on by itself and a system of equations to solve for what output you get with this current source I2 on by itself and then add the results of solving both of those systems together, which to me means you could probably just set up one system of equations and solve it and it would actually be more efficient. So I'm gonna ask you guys to wait to answer part B and part C of this homework assignment because our next class meeting on Friday is in regards to nodal analysis, which is a circuit analysis technique that effectively defines an algorithm for setting up systems of equations to analyze circuits. So since you're gonna to have to set up a system anyway, let's wait until we learn nodal analysis to make the, the rules for setting up the systems make more sense, okay? So just to, to recap here, part A is good practice, part B and C, wait, okay? There is a much, much easier way to do parts B and part C once we have Friday's class. For problem number four, this is actually pretty good practice for superposition. So part one, superposition means nothing. Or excuse me, problem one, superposition means nothing. Problem two is all about the scaling property of linearity. Problem three A is good practice for superposition. Problem four is good practice for superposition. Wait to do three B and three C. Okay, all right. So I think that's enough out of me for today. Um, so work on your in-class assignments. There is no mini lab or anything like that. So you got roughly an hour to, I think, work one problem.